Eminem, a.k.a. Slim Shady, a.k.a. Marshall Bruce Mathis III. He is a survivor, rap star, father, actor, felon, media mogul, the voice of a generation. He has emerged as rap's most contra controversial performer and storyteller, an artist whose provocative imagery and dark rhymes have resonated with America's increasingly disenfranchised youth, and whose multiple personas have enchanted and hypnotized audiences worldwide. Born into a broken home, he has drawn deeply from the well of his own life, which provides the fuel for his vision and artistic will. His lyrics are his life, his legend, his alter ego, and his therapy. To understand his music, we must first understand his life and the world he grew up in. I was born in Highland, Kansas, and my mother left my father when I was probably about nine months old and brought me to St. Joseph, Missouri and left me with my abusive alcoholic grandmother. St. Joseph's, Missouri is a quiet working class town. It is a town Marshall's grandmother Betty grew up in, a town his mother Debbie grew up in. A place tarnished with the effects of alcoholism, abuse, and instability. The challenges in Marshall's family life would be set in motion long before his birth. The residual effects of generations of abuse was passed on by his great-grandmother even as she lay dying. She died a hell of a death at 93, and I was so glad. And she called for me on her deathbed, and I told her, I said, you know, I'm glad you're dying. And she says, can you forgive me? And I says, no, I can't forgive you. The way you beat and abused a little child, a little child, an innocent child. I said, you know, you're going to hell, don't you? And she looked up at me, and I said, God help you. Despite the years of abuse, Betty dreamt of a better life. Well, as a young girl, I wanted to just be a mother. I wanted a great big family, you know. I was going to uh, have this house with a white picket fence, like everybody has, women. <laughs> and uh, I was just going to be so good to my children, bake for them, and, you know, just love them to death. But when everything went wrong, she and I married Mr. Nelson, I was 14. Soon after a young marriage, Betty gave birth to the first of several children, Debbie, Marshall's mother. Oh, Debbie was so tiny, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was being so young, I had a hard labor, and my daughter weighed probably about four pounds. If you were to do a drawing of the Mathers Nelson family relations are like, we look like cats in a bag. This is a clan. It's hard scrabble, country folk who are close to each other except when they're fighting each other. She could not wait to have a baby brother. Not long after a baby brother arrived, Betty realized Debbie was unwilling to share the attention of her mother. Put him down for a nap one time. So I walk into the bedroom and she's got her father's wrench, big wrench, just about to hit him in the head. I had to watch Debbie from then on continuously. Betty's marriage ended and the children had a succession of would-be stepfathers. I cannot remember a time ever when there was not a man in the house. I never really got close to my stepdads. They were pretty much alcoholics. There was a lot, a lot of drama, you know, growing up in our family. There was a lot of police called. I was sexually assaulted by my one stepdad when I was 12. He didn't get the job complete because he was arrested. I remember my mother coming home and the police taking him out and her telling me, you better hope I can get him out of jail. I don't believe you. And I ran away. It's like, I'm not facing him if you get him out of jail. I'm not telling him I'm sorry because I'm not sorry because of something he did. She wanted to get out of the house so bad, Debbie, Debbie just was tired. Debbie searched for a way out. One day she thought she finally found it in a quiet boy who lived on a block and played in a local band. Marshall Bruce Mathers II. I met Bruce and he was my knight in shining armor. Not even when I was 14. Debbie comes in from school about, she says, Bruce and I are getting married. Tell her, Bruce. Yeah, he says, I love Debbie and Debbie loves me and we're getting married. Debbie and Marshall Bruce Mathers II were married in 1970, 
A marriage Debbie hoped would take her away from the troubles of home. It wasn't that I didn't want to be around my brothers and sisters anymore. It's just I wanted my own life. I wanted my own child. And I wanted to get away from all that. The next thing I know, she finally got pregnant. I was pregnant with Ronnie when she got pregnant. On October 17, 1972, Debbie gave birth to Marshall Bruce Mathers III. So he's just in heaven. I mean, it's like this is a child, you know, that's going to have everything. He's not going to want for anything. He's going to be so sheltered, so loved, so protected. He's going to be the best mother in the world. And I made a promise with God. Alcohol, the drugs, the drinking, the pot, all any of that stuff, they would never go through that. The fighting, none of it. Finally happy with her own family, Debbie left for North Dakota, where Bruce would take over his father's job in a hotel. The couple made their home in the basement of Bruce's parents' house. Debbie said that things began to get bad. She'd go down to the coffee shop at the hotel, and Bruce would be playing around with the girls. Naturally, she'd be jealous. He'd tell her to take the kid and go home. She had a lot of lonely time on her hands, and then he began to beat the heck out of her. Marshall Bruce Mathers II was a knife thrower. He threw knives. He used to always like to see how close he could get to your foot without hitting it. And I remember her calling me and saying that um, she's coming home. She left uh, on a train when he was maybe one or two years old. And just She says she took the clothes he was wearing, they got on a the train, they headed for St. Joe. And I think that was sort of the beginning of what was gonna be many, many moves throughout his life. Debbie running again from abuse and the effects of alcoholism left Bruce and returned home to St. Joseph with Marshall. And his dad never wanted anything to do with him. Uh, Marshall tried to contact him. Debbie tried to contact him. He went to California and never was seen again. Bruce Mathers then disappeared from his son's life forever. Like Betty, his grandmother, and Debbie, his mother, Marshall now was caught in the same cycle of parental abandonment. Marshall would never know his father, but he would never forget him. When we first left his dad and moved back to Missouri, I lived in a one-room efficiency apartment. Debbie tried to make ends meet, bouncing from job to job and house to house, always trying to make a better life for her child not realizing the effects such constant change would have on him. Debbie and Marshall moved back and forth from St. Joseph, Missouri to the Detroit area as many as 20 times in his childhood. We did move around a lot, but it was always to better ourselves because I could not stay with my birth mother at all. I mean, we were there a couple of days and that was like an eternity. And every time it would be like I'd rent a house, it'd sell it right out from under me. Debbie may have tried her best, and most parents do. Trying your best, though, doesn't mean that that's exactly what your child needs. Soon, Debbie and her mother began to clash on how to raise Marshall. I don't think he was an angry child. I think he just got his feelings hurt a lot. And I think his mother controlled him a lot. He was a very big mama's boy. Marshall was a loner. He did not really want to get out and play with other kids. I had to kind of coax him. He wanted to be with mommy all the time. He never could speak up for himself, but he'd just go pout and go color his color books, you know, or go get on his bean bag and just watch TV, kind of like a whoop puppy in a corner, you know? Just go back to my corner. He had a disruption in attachment early on in that his father left him. There are people like his Uncle Todd who uh, may be the closest to a, a consistent father figure. You know, I was their protector, you know, and I would take him fishing. I tried to, try to teach him what a man was supposed to be. I'd get on him about homosexuality to make sure he knew that, you know, boys go with girls and, you know, vice versa and, you know, things like that. They moved around a lot. so. He didn't have a lot of stability. Um, so those are some of the early things that may have begun to make him think, is the world a trustworthy place? Is it okay? In the middle of the chaos, young Marshall began to find expression in music. Marshall was surrounded 24-7 with music. Why he was in my stomach, I was saying to him, you know, and 
take the speakers and put all through the house and the rooms. We just always sit against the wall and just be like he'd hummed himself and just bounce back and forth. Constantly. Bounce off the back seat of the car, the couch. If there's music playing, he did this. The teachers would tell me, this kid is retarded. You know, he's bouncing in his desk. He has to sit still. He go like this all the time. He's real hyper. And had to have him on Ridland. And he'd keep going like this and keep going like this. He bounced off the back of the seat the first eight years of his life. Rocked to the music. Growing older, Marshall would find escape in the fantastical world of superheroes and comic books. He was wanting to act out cartoon characters. And so I would let him. You could open the door in his room, and he'd have Castle Grayskull going. Okay, he'd have his cartoons on, he'd have whatever he wanted, but he, he entertained himself a lot. He was all he had for years. He liked it that way. I mean, you know, he played with friends, but he liked, you know, entertaining himself and creating his own little world. He was into Batman, and he was Batman. So everywhere we went with him, he had to wear that outfit. You know, most kids, they'll go, yeah, Batman, and jump off of something. But he had the lines down, he had the moves down. A lot of times kids, when they feel like their external world is impoverished or they feel neglected, they need to feel big and powerful and strong. And they can feel big and powerful st and strong by associating with X-Man, by associating with Batman and Superman, because they have superpowers then. So it really helps them feel like, okay, maybe I'm not so small, maybe I'm not being as abused as much, maybe the world can be okay because I can be He-Man. Marshall's blossoming artistic abilities provided a quiet retreat from the chaos of his surroundings. Marshall loved to draw. They'd get into a lot of arguments and squabbles with teachers saying, he did not draw this free-handed. So I would say to them, okay, well, let's have him draw something. Sit down and draw, tell him what you'd like him to draw. Because he could draw anything. Debbie and Marshall continued to move with Marshall changing schools as often as every two or three months. He was always a new kid. And if he did return to some place he'd been before, he was usually behind. And so those kids didn't know him from before. So he was always starting over somewhere. He talks a lot about, uh, about this nomadic upbringing in his music, this sort of peripatetic life where he's jumping from one place to the other. Ronnie, Betty's son, Debbie's brother, was only two months older than Marshall. While Betty and Debbie clashed on how to raise them, the two boys would continually bond. Their little carriers sit side by side and they make their little baby talk, goos, you know, and uh, there was a bonding already there. It, when they were together, you should have seen them. I mean, you couldn't really tell the two apart. And they both had the same color hair, about the same height. And when they talk, they sound you know, just about the same. I encouraged them, too, to laugh and dance and be happy. The two of them are quite a team. did not want my mother around Marshall. And I'm, that was just me. I had to be there. And Marshall had been told so many lies. I didn't trust her around him. And the dysfunction, the yelling, the screaming, the fighting, the drinking that my stepdads could have been doing, I didn't want him subjected to it. We didn't get too much time together as they started getting older. Debbie, we kept pulling Marshall to Michigan and Ronnie to Missouri. As Marshall approached the end of his grade school years, Debbie and Marshall would settle permanently in the Detroit area, a city still reeling from the race riots and major destruction only a few years earlier. There were a lot of tensions at that time, a lot of racial tensions. The city was in such chaos that uh, the National Guard was mobilized. In the streets of Detroit, a racial war zone had been created by the 67 riots. Marshall would find himself in the middle of all of it. They always lived in neighborhoods barely a step above the ghetto. And in Detroit, Marshall consistently found himself one of the few white kids in predominantly black schools. The neighborhood that Eminem grew up in is uh, particularly interesting because there are still houses there and people still live in them, but they're just across the street from the suburbs. What you end up with there is uh, a neighborhood where people have sort of filled in the gaps. It's almost like hermit crabs. You know, they found a shell that suited them and they could afford. They moved in there and they finally became homeowners. And just across the street, not too far away from there, the people who moved out 
who feel like they didn't move out. They didn't make a choice to move out. They were driven out. And so there's a lot of bitterness and there's a lot of tension that that eight mile divide. As a nine year old at Dort Elementary in Roseville, Michigan, Marshall was bullied for months by an older student named D'Angelo Bailey. These beatings came to a head in January 1982 when Bailey cornered Marshall in a restroom and floored him with a snowball packed with a heavy object. No one reported him missing from class and he was found unconscious and bleeding hours later. It was a nightmare. When my son did not come out of the school and the school denied it, they do that. When they denied anything about my baby laying in the pool of blood in the bathroom and I found him laying there and running out to my van with him with, you know, the teachers and principals, you know, well, we had a skeletal crew, we didn't notice him missing. No one knew how long he'd been there. Um, my main concern was to get him, you know, medical treatment. And because he was, when I, when I found my son, he was in the floor and he was having a seizure. The attack left Marshall in a coma for 10 days. I went in and begged God to spare my son. I was an only child and told him if there was anything ever I did wrong in my life to take me not my child. They told me they gave up on my son, four doctors, or four, in four days, 21 doctors. Once awake from the coma, Marshall's recovery would be long. Having to relearn all his basic motor functions, he also suffered from headaches, loss of vision and hearing, nightmares, and nausea. My medical bills were in excess of over 150,000. I had to quit my job to take care of him, and I mean, it just, it was overwhelming. Anytime you have any kind of head injury, it can be life-changing. So when you have an injury to the brain, the effects can be really long-lasting. I had a patient many years ago who had a head injury, was meek and mild before, turned very angry and aggressive afterwards. It took a year for Marshall to bounce back. I had to work with him every day, teaching him how to tie his shoes. He had become almost like um, an infant. With the medications they had him on, the Depakine and Dilatin, Mopressor, I did not, when I give him the medication, I seen a zombie, and I did not want him zombied out. I didn't believe in it, so the medication was going to go. It comes from my, my, my grandmother's side. She rapped all of her life. She called it rhyming. And she said when she was a little girl in Alabama growing up, she remembers her mama working in the fields, cotton fields. You know, whites work right alongside the blacks in the cotton fields. And they used to rhyme songs and make up things as they went to pass the time. Marshall's father was in the band. And then when we went back to Wollaston, uh, he was in a band somewhat at the State Line Club. And then I was in a band when we went back to Missouri, which was called, it was uh, Riding the Satellites and Daddy Warbucks, which I had sung a little bit of backup. I play guitar, I play piano, I write. Marshall, he, he loved music. Um, his first concert was at Talking Heads. Ronnie played drums, and Marshall tried his hand at drums too. Ronnie was artistic, but not near like my grandson Marshall. Ronnie was always, I mean, when he was little, I got him a toy drums and little boom box, they call them. And uh, he'd turn it up full blast, and boy, he'd just dance all the time. Eminem's uncle, Ronnie, who was about the same age as Eminem, is given a lot of credit for, for sort of infecting him with the rap bug. In 1981, Ronnie played a song for Marshall that would change his life. It was Reckless, a song featuring Ice-T from the soundtrack to the movie Breaking. It was the first rap song Marshall heard, he took the tape from his Uncle Ronnie and played it over and over and over. He started breakdancing at 11 in Missouri and had me hold a sign up that he made, a great big cardboard sign around my neck and it said breakdancing, 25 cents to watch. And I mean, this kid could spin on his head for hours. It's like, you know, you gotta wear your head out. I can remember him sitting in his room for hours. Basically, he'd sit up there and play the same beats over and over and over and write. 
he would wake me up like at three o'clock and I'm like, Mom, is this a word? Does this rhyme? He's like, just please help me find it. So we get the dictionary out. Yes, it's a word. You know, and what's the definition of it? And him and my brother Ronnie would do stupid tapes together and act, you know, like they were performing in front of people. So when he got into music, it was like his natural sense of rhythm came right into his play with his stuff. The two of them, I can just see them. Here would become Ronnie with the speaker from this side and Marshall from this side meeting in the front. They were going to be big singers and rappers, the two of them. They were going to go far away and they were going to be in movie pictures with the rapping and singing. I mean, I can just, I just see them and sometimes I see them and, you know, it's wonderful and other times I break down and cry. Marshall's iced tea influence would need to stay strong to pull him through some serious life changes. The latest in the line of foster kids Debbie Mathers had taken in, Kimberly Scott into Marshall's life in 1988, when she was just 13. I was on call for the state of Michigan every weekend for kids that were dropped off at the welfare department to pick up. Marshall was very jealous of other kids. We, uh, we would sit in a circle and talk. If anybody had a problem, we would discuss it. And he'd jump up and run out because he'd be like, well, you like them more than me. And it's like, no, come here. I'd have to go after him every time. But he was, he was a, it was like, I want mom to myself or not at all. Kim's stepfather didn't want her. Mama said she had to go. So Kim was staying anywhere she could. And I remember going to Michigan and I said, Debbie, what do you got here? Oh, mom, now don't say nothing to her. I've got a daughter now. And Debbie never had any little girls. She took her home, cleaned her up, and was so happy to have a girl. Kim soon settled into the Mathers household, with Debbie doting on her every move. Kim was very spoiled too because I always wanted a daughter. It was tough trying to juggle everything around. I tried to give Kim as much as, every, as much as Marshall or anybody else. She was very insecure and she'd been through a lot when she was younger. She did not know her real father. Kim was uh, real tight-lipped, didn't have much to say. Kim became jealous. Whenever Debbie would be on the couch, Kim would have to crawl in between you. They fought like brother and sisters. You'd never believe that they was ever going to become intimate, you know, get together. When you went up to Marshall's room, he had the whole upstairs to himself. They were always, you know, in resting together. Okay. I thought Marshall wasn't doing too bad in the beginning, you know. She was kind of cute. Debbie said one day she came home and uh, they were playing around, so she ordered Kim out. And Marshall said, I'm going too. So they left. They walked down on Debbie, and Debbie couldn't stand that. And then they're like, we're boyfriend and girlfriend now. And, you know, Kim told me, haha, all the time we were, and you just didn't even know it. But I don't believe that. She helped him in the beginning establish his manhood and, and know who he was. And Debbie was jealous of the relationship. She tried to break him up a lot of times, and it worked. They would fight. And then when the minute they got in a fight, Debbie would add fuel to that flame. She solved a lot of problems when it got way out of hand. Oh, no, Debbie didn't want that. But, you know, she wanted just enough to keep him away, so she had Marshall all to herself. He got kicked out of his mom's. He came and started sleeping at our house, couch surfing. When he first moved in, his mom had this big green boat. He could hear it, like, coming halfway down the street, and he'd be like, rack, rack, rack. If my mom comes up to the door, I don't live here. Why don't you want to talk to your mom? My, your mom? And he's like, oh, she's screwed up, blah, blah. She'd come driving by real slow. He'd be up in the, the visor, peeking out, looking out, like, like, what is she doing? And she'd come up to the door, does Marshall live here? And we were like, no, who, Marshall? Byron Williams is Eminem's former bodyguard and friend. Kim is his mother reincarnated. That's his mother all over again, man. The mental abuse he took from her. All the hitting, you know, she would hit him. I watch her take her high heels off and beat the kid in the head with her shoes. I mean, and he didn't want to hit her back, so he'd punch his car or punch me. She has the potential to be a nice person, man. I just haven't seen that side of her yet, you know, but uh, she shoved me twice. Every day, if they didn't fight, it wasn't normal, you know? It was like they constantly were at each other's backs. A lot of times she was very moody. Um, you know, I wouldn't let him do a lot of things and stuff. 
And um, like I said, she, whenever he'd have something big going on, she'd screw it up. They were probably like, I don't know, Dr. Jekyll meets Mr. Hyde <laughs> relationship, you know. It could turn quick and it could ride out. She's also sort of a, uh, uh, like home for him. She knew him when nobody else did. When he was suffering, when he was trying to, trying to climb, when he was just not sure that it was worth it. I'm in my room getting ready to go to bed and uh, Kim comes over. I hear him out in the kitchen and they're yelling at each other and all of a sudden I hear chairs moving on the floor and sounds like they're going at it. And I'm like thinking to myself, oh my God, what's going on, you know? So I jump out of my room and she's just beating on him. He's not swinging, you know, I'm just like in total shock. Oh my God, you know, she's beating him up. Living a life with repeated violence and abuse, Marshall will continue to be tested. months before that summer and my little brother looked at me and said sis look what I have and I'm thinking well this is nice because he opens the closet and shows me all these quotes and he turns to me and says this is material you know what I'm missing and I said what hon he said love I have no love there's no love here bud, this is Ron poking hard well, life's hard bud on December 14th 1991 Ronnie Polkenhorn killed himself with a gunshot to the head. Ronnie was despondent over a breakup with a girlfriend. Distraught over Ronnie's death, Marshall did not attend his funeral. Betty videotaped her son's funeral and mailed a copy to Marshall. The bitter feud between Betty and her daughter still confuses what the possible intention of the tape may have been. He's really been bitter about that. It just starts the, the organ music and it's the, you know, obituary, you know, and they say, and, and uh, it just shows him in the casket there because it was open casket and all the flowers and all. I thought, you've never been to his funeral. You need to deal with it. You know, this is reality. But he said, I tried to kill him. When he got the tape and the pictures, he collapsed. He said, I was not trying to hurt him. When I was told that she sent him a video, I really don't think that he really thought too much of it because he considers a source. My daughter lied to him, and she said Ronnie would be alive today, but you didn't. You weren't home to take a phone call. That Ronnie called and asked to speak to Marshall, and she said Marshall wasn't home. Marshall needs to know Ronnie did not call him, and the guilt that was put on Marshall, thinking, "My God, it's my fault." With the loss of his uncle and partner, Marshall would now be left alone to struggle. Bad performance in school would make his chances for success even tougher. He flunked the ninth grade three times. Debbie was, you know, Marsha, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for a living? And she was really concerned for him because he had, who did he have? No one. She was scared for the kid's future. Undeterred by his mother's concerns, Marsha would begin focusing intently on his and Ronnie's dream and develop his skills as a rap artist. At the time, Rap lyrics proclaimed an anti-authority message of racial politics and the realities of life in the ghetto. Early rap artists such as Public Enemy, Ice-T, and N.W.A. were beginning to influence and inspire Marshall and his crew. Eminem had decided that he wanted to be a rapper, but uh, as a white rapper, I mean, he really had no role model. There was really nobody else out there. Marshall began making tapes in the basement of his mother's house 
with Deshaun Halton, a Lincoln High School classmate who called himself Proof. Um, he did not meet Proof till he was around probably 18, 17 or 18. Proof was very, very respectful, very polite in his manners. Do you need me to do anything for you? Or he would say please and thank you, or the other kids were just like, get me this or do that, or no, I'm not taking out the garbage. They were using the basement all the time to practice and scratch records, but I found out they were my albums <laughs> that they used to scratch. Marshall and Proof would come out of the basement with a tape they persistently shot to local record stores, including Record Time, run by Harry Bunner. Eminem and his crew that he hung out with, they were the basement production crew, all his cats that he used to hang out with. And they'd come in and they'd buy all the new hip hop that come out. It didn't matter who it was. If it was something new and cool, especially out of New York, they bought it. So all this stuff's coming in and they're buying all this stuff and everything, but anytime anybody locally come out, they hated them, especially Marshall. Marshall's like, these guys suck. These guys don't have no talent. ICP, who are they? They suck. And then he started getting down on Kid Rock and stuff, and I happened to have a shirt on that day, and he's like, you like Kid Rock and everything? I'm like, yeah, I like Kid Rock. I support local hip hop. And he's like, well, he sucks. I go, you're telling me all these bands that suck, but I haven't heard a damn thing come out of your mouth yet. He didn't really make a name for himself until uh, there was a Kid Rock in store that we had. He had just released his album on Jive Records, and um, he just started getting a buzz. So there's all these kids are coming in for Kid Rock stuff. And all of a sudden, here comes this little, skinny little kid with blue eyes. I'll challenge you to a rap right now. Yo, you want a battle? Yo, yo, yo. Kind of in Kid Rock's face. And everybody's like, well, who is this asshole? And oh, it's just that uh, Marshall, there's an Eminem guy that he calls himself. He's just over there rapping. He thinks he's going somewhere and all the, uh, you know, every other word's after this, after that. You know, everybody was looking around like, who is this kid? <laughs> you know, he come, he's coming in the store and bugging Kid Rock. You know, you want to battle? Is like Kid Rock don't battle. You know, Kid Rock's like you know, got his own thing going on. He was really cool about it. And he said, "Listen," he goes, "Today is my day. Your day may come." He goes, "But this is my in store right now. Um, I've heard some of your stuff, and you go way too fast. You need to enunciate. When you enunciate, people understand you." then maybe you can have an in-store like me. So then he became Eminem, and that was really when he began to market himself. With him, you know, he learned the art of business, he learned the art of networking, as well as working on his craft and getting better and better. And in doing that, he was able to meet people and get people to listen to him that maybe were outside of his normal circle of Detroit, which helped him get discovered. Eminem began to hone his craft in earnest, attending open mics and freestyle showcases around Detroit. However, the greatest test of his young life would soon arrive. Kim got pregnant. He came in and he was like, wow, man, I just found out that Kim's pregnant and I'm gonna be a dad, you know, and how am I gonna get a house? I got this job, barely pays enough. Haley Jade Scott was born Christmas Day, December 25th, 1995. I know after Haley was born and everything just seemed like it went uh, huck and high water, the baby was used as a weapon, you know, against Marshall. But instead of following the actions of his father and grandfather, Haley's birth brought a new sense of focus and determination to Eminem. He was going to succeed where his family had failed. Marshall loved his daughter. He stepped up the plate. And, I mean, he did take care of his daughter. Eminem viewed fatherhood as a blessing. He threw himself into providing for his family while polishing his rap skills. Gilbert's Lodge is a down-home roadhouse outside of St. Clair Shores. Marshall worked at Gilbert's on and off for three years. Gilbert's Lodge was probably Eminem's mainstay for a while. I mean, that was his steady gig. When, uh, when the tapes weren't selling, when people weren't coming to his gigs, 
Um, he could always count on going back to Gilbert's Lodge and flipping burgers, and from what I'm told, he was a pretty good short order cook. He would quit there, go to a, a new job for like two weeks, and then go back to Gilbert's, and then quit again, do another job, and then go back to Gilbert's. Working double shifts for minimum wage, Gilbert's became more home than home. When Marshall first started working at Gilbert's, he used to wear those really baggy, baggy pants. And I'm looking at him going, man, pull those pants up, buddy. How can you work and not trip over them? Whenever he worked, just constantly rapping, rapping, holding his skills. When he would get a food order, for example, he'd start a rhyme based on what the food order was, you know. He would bring in tapes for people and say, listen to this, what do you think about this? He'd try and get people to come out to his performances. And a lot of the people did go. I mean, they didn't like rap. They might be at a rough club somewhere in Detroit they wouldn't have gone to otherwise, but they liked him, and so they would go to show the support. Very, very steely focus. That's one thing I'd noticed about him. You know, he was uh, very intense. You could see it in his eyes. Everything would just come off the tops of their heads, and I'd just sit there in amazement. But yet I'd be going, okay, where's my cheese balls? Let's go. Okay, <laughs> I got people waiting for their food, and they're just going on and on and on, you know, and it, it, they did wonderful. It was, it was quite entertaining. When he wasn't working at Gilbert's Lodge, he was working on his career. Marshall would usually write either on a little notebook, on the back of a ticket. Whatever he could write on, he would write on. If it was his hand, or he'd always be writing something down. He would go into the zone, man. It's, I can't even explain it. And when he would go into the zone, he would be completely sober, man. He would put his little headphones on, and he would take his finger like this. And he would actually write the rhymes in his head and writing them out in the air. And he would have like, most people would have like one notepad, but he would have like five, six different pieces of paper. It's almost like he sees the world uh, in a hall of mirrors. And he takes those distorted images and he puts them in his music. There was no school of hip hop where you could walk in and they, you know, you gotta do it like this. He would take a whole page front and back with just small writing. I mean, you'd have to get a magnifying glass to actually see what he was writing because he'd write so small. He would write all these words in like three columns and it would go down. All these words would rhyme and all the words that didn't completely rhyme with them, but he could make them rhyme, he would write them in the next column. And he would go in and pick each one of these words and like match them up. And it's like decoding it. He'd sit down at the table with a track that he liked. He'd play it through and rewind, Bzzz, rewind again. Keep writing, keep writing. He'll go in the booth and he'll sit there and he'll write and he'll listen to it and he'll have the sounds just blaring. And it's pretty much like the same sample over and over and over until he get it completely written. He's going around to the hip hop shops, all these other places. He's getting into these battles downtown. I, I walk out of the step off the steps of St. Andrews and it's an alleyway in between St. Andrews and this other club and there was a big circle out there. I'm like, oh man, they about to fight. And then I'm like, I'll get closer to the circle. I'm like, nah, oh, they got a battle going on, you know. To establish his reputation as a rapper, Eminem began participating in rap battles at various Detroit hip hop clubs. St. Andrew's Hall is a converted church and a popular hip hop club in downtown Detroit. The basement is called The Shelter, one of the most important proving grounds in the city. Being in The Shelter is like being in the basement of your mom's house and you having a big block party. Everybody that comes in knows everybody. Music is pumping and the MCs are up there rapping and everybody is attentive to what they're saying, hanging on every word that they said. Eminem would now have to bear out his talents in front of all black audiences. Like the song Lose Yourself from the 8 Mile soundtrack, the stage at St. Andrews gave Eminem his first shot. Even when M would go up there and you always had the people who just like didn't get into him, you still had the other people that really got into him. He really had no role model. There was really nobody else out there. And in Detroit at the time, there was a place called the Hip Hop Shop. Saturdays at the Hip Hop Shop, I think they started around 12 noon. Uh, and um, proof would usually host and DJ Head would usually spin the records. Um, I mean, it was pretty much based on the audience ruling who, who got burned the hardest and who was most triumphant. The rap battles were, they were deep, you know, you might dig into somebody's personal life, but you know, 
it was whoever could put their lyrics together the best. You know, and week after week, you could tell when somebody went home and they were practicing and they lived and breathed it. That's the thing about, you know, going to the rap battles. The guys that were rapping were just some guys who decided yesterday that they want to rap and they decided they were going to write some stuff. No, these guys lived and breathed hip hop. But Eminem's early battles were hard fought and never easily won. You just come out, start rhyming, and it was done and leave the stage. And people were like, yeah, he's really good. He was putting like 110% in of everything, with any rap battle, any, anywhere he could be noticed. He was dedicated, he was trying to make it. He was trying to explain to Kim, look, you know, this could be our big break, let me do it. She was always had a, a word in about him doing that. Why are you doing this? You need to go out and buy your dad, you know, your daughter diapers. Teaming up with Proof and local Detroit producers, Jeff and Mark Bass, Eminem made his first record and two song EP called Backstabber. Backstabber, which was inspired by this fight that he had with Kim, his girlfriend at the time. I think that was the first time he really let rip with his emotions on uh, recording. He took his uh, tax money and pressed it up. He pressed like uh, 500 to 1,000 copies. The song did okay. I mean, it didn't do massive amounts of numbers. I think he sold like 200 of them. Mark Kempf was Eminem's first manager. Mark founded Underground Sounds Magazine, a national hip hop publication based in Detroit. Unlike other hip hop magazines at the time, Underground Sound paid attention to up and coming artists, especially if they were from the same hometown of Detroit. My original meeting with Eminem was a phone conversation. He called asked me how does he submit his tape, He's, he likes the magazine, he's interested in getting some type of coverage in the magazine. He sent in a tape, I liked it, I reviewed it. You could hear that there was some talent here. You could just hear it, that something's gotta happen here. It's just too good not to happen. Nothing happened. He said a lot of people took him as a joke and he went through a lot of reverse racism and Proof kinda gave him pretty much the ghetto pass. When he first put the tapes out, you know, people were like, eh, you know, not really feeling it. You didn't even finish school, now you want to rap? You're going to be a white rapper? It's not going to work. You know, everybody from his school, from, you know, guys in the neighborhood, the nightclubs, people laughed at him. When he was in the suburbs, the white kids didn't want to listen to this kid singing black music. And when he was in the city, the black kids didn't want to hear this white kid playing black music and trying to perform black music. Somebody at the end of the show, he was passing something out, and the guy took it, said this is a joke, throws it out, and there's just like some altercation. All I saw was this massive amount of people into this little swarm, and he's in the middle of it. I settled everything, tempers, you know, settled down and stuff. And that's when I knew that there was something else behind this guy, that he was very serious about what he wanted to do, and he took offense with what people said to him. Here he did all this work and put all this stuff out, and people were throwing the trash and weren't even giving it a listen. Even through a stormy relationship with Kim, the continual struggles of raising a daughter and the grind of working a minimum wage job, Eminem relentlessly pursued his music career. Working once again with Jeff and Marky e. Baz, the producers who had been mentoring him since he was 15, Eminem was able to complete and release his second recording, Infinite. Infinite comes out. I thought it was a really good album all the way through. It was out on cassette, it was out on vinyl. I remember hearing it, listening to it, thinking, God, this guy's really good. I walked into this club to see some groups. I wanted to see Proof's group, Five Ella. Wasn't expecting Eminem. Proof was like, you heard the new Eminem stuff. I was like, no, but this uh, a dude over there just brought me his new, new album. I was like, I want to meet Eminem. Where's Eminem at? He was like, that dude. I was like, wait a minute, the white dude that just brought this up to me, that's Eminem? I was floored because I got that tape and a couple others and that was all I listened to. Wondered why he was still rapping in tiny clubs to 10 people. For local artists, getting on the air of hip hop radio station, WJLB, is a gateway to success in Detroit and beyond. DJ Bushman has followed the scene for years, hearing all the potential hopefuls.
He was cool with Bushman, but Bushman didn't have the say of what went on the air. Again, there, you had to be black to be on the air, and if you weren't, then you didn't get it. You got tossed aside. Today's hit music, 93.1. Eminem made another important radio connection. DJ Lisa Lisa sponsored open mic nights during her program. Eminem called persistently to audition. Lisa Lisa was impressed with his drive and lyrical expertise, so she invited him on. He became a station favorite and one of her regulars. One of the first couple of raps he did, I think it was that he was locked in a psycho ward or something, but it was, it was almost like a joke. It was like a comedy, but then you listen to it and it had such a dark undertone. When he jumped on the mic, he turned all of that anger that he felt in the room, teasing him, into a, a strength, and he ended up winning. I just remember sitting there watching this little blonde white kid, like, what are you doing? How are you turning this around on these guys? For me, for him being white, I didn't care. I would listen to it. I always try to give any feedback to uh, anybody I could about their music. Though the album made people in the Detroit music scene aware of Eminem's talent and abilities, Infinite was a commercial flop. Eminem and the Bass Brothers got stuck with the bill. He was respected, but not respected. I think there was more talk behind his back. He used to come home discouraged a lot. There's days he'd be like, man, I just want to give this up. I want to forget it. I'm going to be done with it. I'm going to just keep working, do what I got to do to get by. When he realized he was going to have to work for a living, Marshall and, and my sister would compete over who had the most pills. Yeah, they would fight over who had the most, not who had the pills, who had the most pills. The black community said no to him. He was sort of the white zebra. You're not black, we don't want you here. He was out of place. This boy, he wanted to die. Recovering from the commercial failure of Infinite, the rest of Eminem's life was crumbling beneath him. He was fired from Gilbert's, he was constantly fighting with Kim, and he couldn't support his daughter Haley. He was fed up, pissed off, and at the end of his rope. In a moment of desperation, clinging to the memory of his Uncle Ronnie, Eminem tried to kill himself by swallowing a handful of pills. Out of the darkness of Eminem's suicide attempt came a renewed inspiration to find the voice he would need to succeed as an artist. There's a story that I've been told where he was talking to Buddha Full of Rhymes, who's another Detroit rapper, and he was telling him, you know, I'm just not getting anywhere with this. And so I'm thinking of trying something different. We were telling him that he needed a gimmick, an image. And his identity was masked because he didn't know who to be. He got fed up. His ego totally flipped. They don't like the good stuff, you know, I'm going to just start screwing around and writing some stuff and said, hey, I'm going to start writing the craziest stuff that you could possibly imagine. He had this alter ego called Slim Shady. And we were just like, wow. Wow. He's got a totally different sound. That's right when he really started getting looked at. Mark Kemp, Eminem's first manager, arranged for proof and another Detroit area rapper named Bazaar to attend some meetings with music executives in New York. Bazaar knew Eminem from the Detroit rap scene and invited him to go along. Bazaar played his stuff and Eminem played his stuff and I think Bazaar told me Eminem got a little bit better response. I remember when he called me and got my feedback on a, on a new record he was making and he rapped just the two of us to me. It blew my mind. I was like, whoa, wow and it was uh, the Slim Shady EP. Oh my God, this is so good. Murder, murder, you know, went up to Eastland, shot a policeman. When you hear Slim Shady rapping, if you listen to his music, it's really distinctive which are the Eminem tracks and which are the Slim Shady tracks. The Slim Shady tracks are the harder edge. They're the more bitter, the more vindictive tracks. No longer has he been the kid that was being picked on or bullied or told he wasn't gonna mount anything. That was his dark and evil side. 
that basically was coming out. You start saying all these things about different people. Gay bashing, the homophobic stuff, lesbians, potheads, uh, doing drugs, anything associated with violence. The Slim Shady EP was released in 1997. When this came out, this was no joke. I mean, with people putting aside Infinite and stuff because he sounded like somebody else, when he did this EP, there was, Slim Shady was born. And it got a positive response. And it allowed him to take out a lot of his frustrations. And we were getting successes. We were selling tapes out at different stores. And we were getting shows. And we kept selling them, getting them and stuff. We knew we had something here. Steady sales of the Slim Shady EP proved that Eminem was ready for the next level. Scribble Jam is an urban arts festival that celebrates the hip hop lifestyle. The annual summer event is a convergence of aspiring MCs, graffiti artists, DJs, and b-boys. Even with the forward progress of his music, Eminem's family life would still remain in a state of turmoil. I really had to talk Eminem into it. I mean, he was like, I'm broke. I was like, don't worry about it, I'll cover you. You should just make some time and go down there. He had a show the night before, so it was like, it was probably 3, 8, 3 or 4 a.m. before we even got on the road to Cincinnati. Slim Shady competed at Scribble Jam in 1997. It was an opportunity for his new persona to showcase his freestyle and battle rap abilities he had been crafting on the streets for a broader audience outside of Detroit. I'm gonna start blowing on my corner max inside the trash. From now on, I'm jacking off the pictures of your bitch ass. This is a mismatch. You probably sit the cage. You better beg him to start it over and pick a different day. There were 80 people that entered the MC battle. One of them was Eminem. Out of 80 MCs, he battled his way to number two. He lost to a guy named Juice. I remember him coming back and telling me that he finished in second place in Cincinnati, where they kind of had it fixed because the guy from the store won. You know, there was a few, and everybody's like, oh, that white boy won, the white boy won, and he lost to this guy, and he should have won. He was frustrated, but he was excited because he knew he should have won. But then again, he finished in second place, he just says, well, I'm just gonna do it one step more. And no matter where he did or where he worked or whatever, he always told everybody he was gonna be a star. You just watch. While a second place finish at Scribble Jam, Y and Eminem and Slim Shady's reputation beyond the streets of Detroit, there was no immediate financial benefit. Eminem returned to an empty home. Kim and Haley, following the family cycle, left him to live with relatives in Warren, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit. The new Slim Shady went back to the old Eminem couch surfing ways, ultimately ending up in a place he had worked for years to avoid. Here's a guy up until the time he made it, when he was in his mid to late 20s, he was still living with his mom, even when he had a girlfriend and a baby. At a music industry conference in Detroit, Mark Kemp approached Wendy Day, an influential music industry power broker and gave her the Slim Shady EP. I was like, I'm gonna give you something I really want you to pay attention to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this tape by this guy, Eminem. He's a white guy, but he's gonna floor you. Initially reluctant, Wendy was won over by his masterful handling of words, rhythm, and his Slim Shady persona. She was putting together an event with um, a magazine called Rap Sheet in LA. She was organizing an event within the event called Rap Olympics. And they would, the teams would battle in things such as uh, storytelling would be one battle or picking stuff out of a hat. She was like, I'm putting together this team. I want Eminem on the team. I got Thurston Howell III. I got Juice. She wanted M to finish it off. I told Eminem he should do it. He should definitely do it. She flew him out. I got a ticket. I flew out. At the Rap Olympics, Eminem again finished second to the same rapper, Juice. Yet the trip to LA yielded much more important results. 
when Eminem went out to LA, he was basically someone who had beaten the local talent, who had gotten a little bit of a regional reputation. But the Rap Olympics was a chance for him to showcase in a major forum. A LA based radio station had Eminem on the air. It really lit up the airwaves. Eminem dropped some verses that had people's wigs blown back for real. I met a guy from Interscope. I gave him a tape. Everything Eminem had worked for, the embodiment of his struggles, determination, perseverance, and tears were in that tape, the Slim Shady EP, and it was finally in the right hands. While Eminem's tape was circulating through Interscope, he made a second appearance on the same LA radio show. And not only did he do well, but he caught the ear of Dr. Dre, and Dr. Dre basically, by the time he went to Detroit, was ready to take him to the world. Dr. Dre is one of the most influential producers in rap music. In 1992, he founded Death Row Records with Suge Knight. He also engineered the careers of Snoop Dogg and Tupac, among others. Shortly after listening to the Slim Shady EP, Dr. Dre signed Eminem to a recording deal with his label Aftermath Records. After months of recording, the Slim Shady LP was released by Aftermath and Interscope Records. The result was instantaneous. When the first single hit from his first album, Hi My Name Is, become a buzz clip song, we had an in-store and there was a thousand people here. He was just signing. Finally, they come out there and they told him, they said, look, that's all you can sign. You're done. You've been here for three, four hours signing stuff. That's when you, we, you found out that this wasn't the guy that comes in and talks to you all the time. This is the time you find out this guy's going off and we may never see this guy again. When Eminem first started to make it was you could still see on some of the telephone poles in town or on some of the uh, some of the walls near some of the music venues, you could still see scraps of an Eminem poster. Most of those posters were put up there by Eminem himself. Eminem's fame came like a flash flood. It caught a lot of people by surprise, even Eminem himself. The Slim Shady LP debuted at number three on the Billboard charts and would go on to sell one million copies by the end of that year. On June 14, 1999, in the wake of Eminem's worldwide success as an artist, he and Kim got married, but the relationship remained tumultuous. I think with Kim, he always knows where she's coming from. He doesn't always like it, but I think that's someone where he feels like she's with me for who I am. In July 2000, Kim attempted suicide by slashing her wrist. Kim recovered, though a month later the couple was separated. They reunited later that year for a few months. But on March 1st, 2001, they filed for divorce. Weeks later, Kim filed a $10 million defamation lawsuit against her husband. He probably feels that, you know, why couldn't I have had a more traditional upbringing? And I can understand being upset about that. But if he had had a more traditional upbringing, we wouldn't have Eminem today. Because that is really the raw fuel for what he is. In September 1999, Debbie Mathers filed a $10 million lawsuit against her son for defamation of character. The lawsuit cited numerous instances in lyrics and interviews in which Marshall described his mother as abusive, a drug user, and an unfit parent. I am who I say I am, he says in his music. And he talks about his mom suing everybody. One of the first things I started to do was to check the courthouses. And lo and behold, going back 25 years, she's been suing folks. As a response to Eminem's lyrical criticisms, Debbie recorded a song called Set the Record Straight with a group called IDX. The song is available for purchase on the internet for $3. In 2002, Eminem's mother settled a $10 million defamation lawsuit against her son for only $25,000. After considerable legal costs, Debbie received only $1,600. Though Betty has been outspoken about her daughter's lawsuit against her son, she too is capitalizing on his fame. She is writing a tell-all book about her daughter's relationship with the rap star. In 2003, 
Ken was arrested and charged with possession of over 25 grams of cocaine. Ordered to wear an electronic device, she skipped town only to be recaptured and jailed for testing positive for cocaine use. Marshall fought for joint custody of his daughter Haley and won. He continues to play a major part in her life. People are on the ins and on the outs at times with him. You know, depending on, on who's feeling cranky that day, he's talking a part of the family and he's not talking to other parts and they seem to take turns. It's almost like a revolving door, but there always still seems to be a fairly strong connection to the family. Eminem has been the target of other lawsuits from more unlikely sources. D'Angelo Bailey, the bully who beat Marshall into a coma and later became the inspiration for the song Brain Damage, filed a $1 million defamation lawsuit against Eminem in 2001. Bailey, a Roseville trash collector, claims that Eminem did permanent damage to his musical career and caused him anger and embarrassment. The suit was dismissed by Judge Deborah Savito. Her written opinion was issued in the form of a 36-line rap song. Mr. Belly complains that his rep is trash, so he's seeking compensation in the form of cat. Belly think he's entitled to some monetary gain, cause Eminem used his name in vain. Eminem says Belly used to throw him around, beat him up in the jaw, shove his face in the ground. Eminem contends that his rap is protected by the rights guaranteed by the First Amendment. Eminem maintains that his story is true, and that Belly used to beat him black and blue. An alternative, he states that the story is phony And a reasonable person would think it's baloney The courts must always balance the rights Of a defendant in one place in a false light If the plaintiff presents no question of fact To dismiss is the only acceptable act If the language uses anything but pleasing It must be highly objectionable to a person or reason Even if objectionable and causing offense Self is the first line of defense Yet when Bailey actually spoke to the press What do you think? He didn't address those false light charges that so disturbed. Prompted from Belly, not a single word. So highly objectionable, it could not be. Belly was happy to hear his name on a CD. Belly also admitted he was a bully in you, which makes what Marshall says substantially the truth. This doctrine is a defense well known and renders Belly case substantially blown. The lyrics are stories that no one could take as fact. They're an exaggeration of a childish act. Any reasonable person can see that the lyric could only be hyperbole. It is therefore this close ultimate position is that Eminem is entitled to summary disposition. One of the things about the people who knew Eminem when he was just Marshall Mathers is that there's a genuine affection for him. You know, neighbors, chefs, waitresses at Gilbert's Lodge or the other places he hung out, people at record stores, people who used to make rhymes and, and record their own rap and their own music and beats. There isn't this feeling that, why him? You know, I'm as good as he is. Um, people seem to genuinely understand and recognize that this was a talent far beyond anything they had. When you look at Marshall Mathers, there's the little kid who's still there. There's a Slim Shady who got him to where he is today. But then there's Eminem who says, you know what, Slim Shady isn't real. You know, let's, let's enjoy what he does. Let's use this to get my demons out. But also, let's not take it too seriously. Because if you do, you're going to go crazy. Eminem is the writer slash rapper. Marshall Mathers is the good father but also the person that was picked on as a kid, uh, that was bullied. And Eminem and Marshall Mathers got together and created Slim Shady, who was the bully, the hip-hop bully, the hip-hop juggernaut. To me, he's not Slim Shady. He's not him and him. He's that little kid I know <laughs> from the hood. Marshall is a really good person. He's a good father, but there's I think the Slim Shady guy is like the evil, the evil person that, you know, that wants to go out and like try all these different things and say I've been there and done that and, and where the other one is trying to be super daddy and, and be sweet and, and you know, do all these things with the kids and, and it's like almost sometimes you feel like you're dealing with a Jekyll and Hyde. He's a very complicated boy. Eminem has stayed true to the city and friends that nurtured him. Forming D12 with Proof, 
Bizarre, DJ Craze, Mannix, and others from his early days. One thing I like about M, you know, whenever you talk about hip hop or you talk about film, you only hear New York and you hear LA. And M still lives here. He keeps things here. He shoots videos here. And he had the 8 Mile DVD release party here, which was great. Eminem did two concerts in North America this year, and both of them were in Detroit. If you want to come see me, you got to come to Detroit. Might be the only reason in your whole life you've ever said, I got to come to Detroit. But if you want to see Eminem, you got to come to my hometown. Two shows sold out. The mayor of Detroit welcomes him back as a conquering hero, even appears in a video that they showed during the performance. But when you come home and the people are welcoming you with open arms and, and hailing you, then uh, that's it. You know, that's the gold standard. Detroit was here waiting for him. And I think anytime he comes back, he just has to say when and people are going to come running. The Slim Shady LP sold over 3 million copies. The follow up, the Marshall Mathers LP released in May 2000, became the fastest selling rap album in history. It was also the first rap album ever nominated for the Album of the Year Grammy. In November 2002, Eminem starred in the box office smash 8 Mile. The title track, Lose Yourself, won the Academy Award for Best Original Song. Eminem, a.k.a. Slim Shady, a.k.a. Marshall Bruce Mathers III, has no skeletons in his closet. Instead, he has turned his tormented past into the world's most lucrative public therapy session. Out of the ordinary, uh, he do crazy stuff, man. I can recall one time, you know, a lot of things that he did wasn't funny right away. When you look back, this guy's crazy, man. I can remember one time we were in San Francisco where he was performing and this guy was heckling him on stage. And he stops in the middle of the show. So he starts heckling the guy back. And him and this guy is going back and forth. Next thing I know, he jumps off the stage to hit this guy, hit the wrong guy. So the whole, everybody in the whole front row just like mobs Eminem. And they're just, they're beating him down, man. They're beating him something serious, man. So I'm sitting there looking at this like, wow. They're gonna kill him. So I jump in, I jump in, I get hit. Then after I get hit, I hit the guy that hit me. I forget about Eminem. The DJ jumps in, the street team jumps in, all these people backstage jump in and we pull him out of the crowd, get him back on stage. Now the whole crowd's about 3,500 people. Everybody wanna kill us. So I'm trying to get him back. I'm trying to get him back uh, to the tour bus. So we're, we're all running. We're getting everybody to run back to the tour bus and the tour bus, the tour manager stops and say, hey, you gotta finish the show. The show must go on. I'm like, man, they're gonna kill us. And, you know, they holler, you know, F you slim, F you slim. So he comes back out and uh, he does uh, Just Don't Give a, you know, and, and performs that and the crowd just go nuts, man. But that next morning, man, everybody had black eyes, swollen jaws, busted noses. You know, and he lived for that, man. I got a call that next morning from my mom. was like, you know, don't you let the little white boy get you in trouble. I said, well, I'm going to try to do what I can. Man. It, it, I don't know how she found out, but she knew about it. You know, we just always did crazy stuff, man. Um, so unpredictable, man. You know, I think that's probably one of the coolest things about him, man. When Eminem was just Marshall Mathers, he could barely afford to shop at Kmart and now he owns a house that was owned by the CEO of Kmart. When Eminem went out to LA, he was basically someone who had beaten the local talent, who had gotten a little bit of a regional reputation. But the Rap Olympics was a chance for him to showcase in a major forum. And based on his performance out there, he, um, eh, let, me, let me say that again. What did I say before about that? He did some good shit and Dre dug it. <laughs> I'm out. I'm outie. Um, okay. He came over for Mother's Day. She was so happy with the bouquet of flowers he bought her for Mother's Day. It was the biggest, most beautiful. She said, I said, Debbie, that must have cost $200. Oh my God, no, that must be $500. It must have cost $600. I mean, and she was taking care of it. It was getting all brittle. <laughs> Two weeks after Mother's Day, the arrangement still sitting there. Oh, what? be careful my flowers. Look how beautiful that is. And Haley made her a picture she'd painted, you know, Happy uh, Mother's Day Grandmother. And it was it had a big house on it with the sun shining, you know, typical little girl. 
And it was a beautiful picture. It was real big, about like this. She still has it. She took it off the wall, though. And it's really neat. How about this long neck? Do I need a jacket? <laughs> you know, you know, you really actually look like Audrey Hepburn. I don't want to look like her. <laughs> no, in a good way. Audrey Hepburn with fleshed out with more womanly figure. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I was told I looked like uh, Reba McIntyre for years. <laughs> for years, I was her. <laughs> It's one of those things, man, you can't wait to see what he's going to do next. It's like watching a living soap opera, man.